bigger. Thank you. Thank you, Pat, very much. And hey, thank you all for coming. Wow, this is, I, I thought, well, there's going to be 10 or 20 people there, you know, but. Uh, yeah, when, when Pat asked me about having a show here, she said, uh, you have to give a little talk. So I, I thought, well, okay, well, uh, I'll, I'll work something out. And I'm going to try to keep it short. I know most of you are standing and so on. But uh, I, I did want to kind of explain the strangeness as you look around this room that there's some, you know, there's like this Picasso-ish kind of thing. There's, there's, there's some almost expressionist kinds of things. And, I think the portrait of me is the best. <laughs> 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 and then, you know, some of my more recent things, these are both from last year, uh, 2018, and a couple other things from 2018. But, you know, uh, if I, real quickly, I could tell you, you know, how did I get started? People are saying, well, how did you get started? And it really boiled down to milk and cookies. And if you uh, have a child, a grandchild, or whatever, and you want them to be an artist, uh, I'll tell you how my mother did it. You know, uh, she she would she was always busy, you know, and she would say, hey, "Fred, just go over here," and she would give me blank paper and crayons, and she would say, "Draw me a a, a, a clown," you know. And I would, just, and I'm like three years old. And I would draw a clown because I saw Clarabelle the clown on TV all the time, you know, the Happy Duty show. That's how old I am. But, uh, so I would draw Clarabelle or something like that, and I'd take it and give it to my mother, and she would, oh, Fred, this is so wonderful. Come have some milk and cookies. You know? <laughs> <laughs> of course, I was, you know, I was quiet and out of her hair for like an hour, and I, you know, so anyway, instead of sitting a, a kid in front of the TV, and so she sat me down with paper and crayons, and I spent hours and hours as a little kid, even before kindergarten, <coughs> drawing animals. She she would always read to me these animal books, and I would. She said, you remember what the elephant looked like? Can you draw an elephant? You know, I would draw an elephant. So that's really how I got started. And uh, so the currency of milk and cookies, you know, <laughs> and, and right away in my brain, at, at three years old, it was, okay, if you do a nice drawing, someone gives you milk and cookies. <laughs> <laughs> so, you tell people, you know, you're, you're like a junior in high school or something like that, and you, go to your guidance counselor and they say, well, what do you want to be? And I say, well, I want to be an artist. And there we go. <laughs> uh, uh, what I want to know, Fred, is how are you going to make a living? <laughs> and I would say, well, I, I want to be an artist. You know, and they would say, well, you know, you can't make a living as an artist. And uh, so, you know, they kind of steered me towards uh, being a teacher. And I went to Indiana. It was State Teachers College at the time. and. Uh, I lasted one year there, and I realized that I, what I really wanted was to study nothing but art, and I came here to the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. <clears throat> and I have a very quick story about the, how I made that decision, because it, it was a big decision, because I, I thought, well, you know, you've got to make a living. Yeah, okay, I want to tell you, you have to make a living. And I went to the academy, and the director of the school said, don't come to this school. I said, you, 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 you're, you're going to get stay and get your teaching credentials, and you'll have a nice life. A nice <laughs> life. <laughs> so, but my father, you know, my mother was very important. My father, he had a, a, a really crucial event that happened in his life that uh, had a tremendous impact on me. Uh, when he was a young man, in his 20s, he was a singer. Now, we're talking about the 1930s. And he, would, he sang all the commercials on KQV radio in Pittsburgh. And they had posters. I, I saw posters that he had. Uh, the Bing Crosby of Pittsburgh, Ollie Danziger, you know. And uh, he, he had a really flourishing career as, as, a, as a singer. And one day, a, a big band, the Jan Garber Orchestra, came to Pittsburgh and they had lost their lead singer. So they very quickly set up auditions for some of the local talent, 
And my dad went to this audition, and he did his routines, and they said, you're our man. <coughs> we're, we're taking you to Cleveland. Go pack your bags right now. Well, my father had just met my mother shortly before that, oh. and he was, he was in love, right? And he's like, I can't do it. You know, I, I, you know I, can't, I can't do it. So he turned it down. So they took the other guy, oh. Perry Como. <laughs> I, I swear, Perry, Perry Como was, was from Cannonsburg, Pennsylvania. And he, he, was, he and my dad were like guys in Pittsburgh that were well known. You know? wow. So my dad always told me, you know, he spent the rest of his life working in steel mills. And it was assumed that I was going to work in steel mills. Did he sing to your mother at least? Uh, my father, I could go on and on about my father. My father could quiet a bar with, I, 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 not to let this drag on too long, but. I tried his not to work. Well, I, I, I went, you know, my father and mother divorced eventually, and I, I went home one Christmas, and uh, I said, where's dad? You know, she said, well, you can probably find him in one of the bars in Carnegie. You know, I mean, that's, I love both my parents, but that, that's, 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 that was the life, all right? So my friends and I, we went down to Carnegie and we walked into the bar. Sure enough, my dad's sitting there at a bar. It's like Christmas Eve. And I'm like, Dad, hey, Fred, you know? And we have a nice little reunion, and I, and I said to him, would you sing White Christmas for us? And he's like, I'd be glad to. And he talks to the bartender and he says, my boy wants to hear me sing right White Christmas. And the bartender took a glass and bang, and he says, everyone shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Always going to sing White Christmas. <laughs> and the bar went quiet. <laughs> and he had this wonderful baritone. And I just wish I had recorded him, you know. Uh, just Perry, Perry Como and my father, very similar voices. Yeah. And he sang White Christmas and, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's like the one the dry eye in the bar, you know. I mean, it, it, it was it was quite. But that that's you know, and that story of and my father always told me when I was debating, should I stay in Indiana? Should I go to Philadelphia? My dad said, you go to Philadelphia. He says, don't you know if you want to be an artist, put everything into that. And that's how I came to Philadelphia and I studied at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, where I had tremendous faculty, wonderful teachers. Uh, I won't name them all, you know, I mean, because you'd leave somebody out, but yeah, what, what a great school. I love that period of time. Uh, and, you know, the, the kind of work I was doing in the early days, nobody wanted to buy it. You know, you know who? Who wants a flayed figure hanging in their house? <laughs> I do. <laughs> but that's all right. You know, all, all part of the times. <laughs> now, I, the, I, I'm almost down here. <laughs> because what I wanted to stress was the shift from essentially uh, very, somewhat gruesome paintings. And some of the most gruesome ones are not here. <laughs> uh, so. You know, that kind of work, I, I was, I kept doing it, and uh, in 1974 or so, I went, my wife and I went to the Florida Keys, and I went skin diving on a coral reef, a place called John Pennekamp Park. And I'm down there, I had never seen anything like that underwater world, right? And, and I, when we got back, I thought, I've, I've got to try to translate that into painting. And so I started doing what I called underwater skates. Uh, they were all sold. I don't have any of those to show. Uh, but the important thing as far as the change in my thinking was that that place was, was there because, this, because of its beauty. Uh, a crusading journalist named John Pennekamp 
took it upon himself to preserve this coral reef because they were going to build a marina there. And that marina meant they were going to have to dynamite these coral reefs so that the boats could come in and out. And, and they were going to put up condos and things like that. And he hired some underwater photographers to go down and say, this is what you're going to be dynamiting. And people just said, no, we can't let this happen. And they turned it into a state park. And what that, what that said to me was, that, uh, you, you know, be, being an environmentalist and a lover of nature, and seeing nature threatened, especially in the early 70s before Earth Day and all that, I mean, it just seemed like the world was being poisoned everywhere you looked, right? And thankfully, things have gotten quite a bit better. Uh, certainly, a long way to go yet. But I, I, these paintings, really, the suspended figure, you know, he's being suspended onto some artificial grass. It's all about alienation from nature and, uh, you know, poisoned environment. I use the spray spray gun on the, just uh, make the air look uh, somewhat toxic in that, uh, things like that. But then I realized, okay, Pinnacamp saved this reef by exploiting the beauty of it. And I started doing these paintings, and people started buying them and saying, oh my god, this, I didn't realize, you know, how beautiful a coral reef is. And I realized that you can, one of the best things nature has going for it is its beauty. It's pure beauty. We don't want to despoil things. The whole, the whole thing about the national parks, Yellowstone, all that, uh, what the Hudson River School, Bierstadt, and those artists did, you know, it's the beauty of nature that is the thing that will save it in the end, I think. At least that's, that's what I keep telling myself. So, so I began to concentrate on doing beautiful paintings, uh, highly rendered kind of paintings, and that's why I made that switch from the grotesque to the beautiful. Ask if you now want, if you'd like. And, yeah, uh, another question over here. Uh, <coughs> like, how did you why, do that? Why paint paintings? Isn't, isn't real art all conceptual art, you know? Like, uh, <laughs> like making golden toilets and painting your own feces and stuff like that. Yeah, that's... There's a, there's a lot of debate about that, uh, and I, I think a hundred. Yeah, you know, there's something called the dumpster test, which is very interesting. You know, if, if you went to a dumpster and you saw this in the dumpster, you would know that there's something wrong with that. You know, but a lot of these conceptual things that you see, you see them in a dumpster, and think, well, oh, I guess someone's rehabbing a house or something like that. <laughs> so I I like. Thank you all very much. Show you this. I, a couple of years ago, I was, I was asked to do some illustration work for a group called History Making Productions, uh, run by Sam Katz, that many of you might may know. And uh, a former student of mine was the creative director for the company, and she called me up and said, "You know, we really need a good illustrator." And I said, "And I had just retired from teaching." And I said, "Tell me what you need. Maybe we can work it out." I've done about eight different films for them. They're, they're broadcast on Channel 6 and Channel 12, and things like that. And uh, two years ago, we were nominated for an Emmy. We got all excited. We went to the Emmy dinner. We didn't win. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> this year we went, and sure enough, we won the Emmy. And I got, I got sure. one. Yeah. And, uh, Before, 
and, and I'm not I'm real big on celebrity culture or anything like that at all anyway. You know, so and I, I thought, ah, who needs an Emmy, you know? You know? <laughs> no, I, I, I'm getting a good dinner here. And, <laughs> <laughs> and then when they called our name and everyone at the table, all of our group, we stood up and, uh, and I stood up and I'm like, damn, I'm going to get one of these. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, you know, they had it set up with the big screens on the side and everything, and the, they had an orchestra there playing and everything. I went up and this beautiful young girl comes out and she handed it to me. <laughs> Man, this is an Emmy! <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty neat. And, uh, I, I, you know, it, it, it doesn't say anything about these paintings, but it does say something about my... Uh, it says that you followed your father's advice. Yeah. yeah. You know, I wish my mother and father would have seen this. I mean, I'm sure they're looking down. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, yeah, so any, anyway, I'll have this up here if anyone wants to take it. Don't tell us I'll hand it to you. Okay, I'm going to ask the, uh, us all to give Fred a little bit of a break so we can have an adult beverage. I would <laughs>